in the past, I've been pretty hard on Bigfoot dramas. You all know I like it when he's biting people's heads and ripping wieners off. But that's not to say there aren't some good movies out there. And The Dark Divide is one of the good ones. It's loosely based off real life butterfly and moth researcher Robert Pyle as he treks through an area of the Grifford Pinchot National Forest called the Dark Divide. He is searching for undiscovered butterflies, but what he finds is so much more. Bob, played by David Cross, pulls into a gas station and starts talking to the attendant about his plan to trek across the country in search of butterflies. Uh, and moths. And moths. I get that this is a good way to set up the movie. It introduces us to the main character and informs the viewer on what's happening. But why does it always have to be a gas station? Like in every movie, they pull into a gas station and tell the worker their whole life story. I used to work at a gas station. I can promise you, we don't care. As he's driving to the trailhead, Bob is reminiscing about his past and thinking a lot about his wife, Thea, played by Deborah Messing. She's been diagnosed with cancer and seems to be in the late stages of it. Even so, she has a positive attitude and brags about her husband's books, which she illustrates. The way Bob deals with the stress of this whole situation is to shoot kids in a game of laser tag. But not having any children of his own, he needs to sneak in and promptly gets caught. He snaps back to reality and gathers up all his gear. And it's pretty clear he's not prepared for this trip. Sure, he's set financially. He has fancy new boots and all the gear one would need for a month-long backpacking trip. But he's just not an experienced hiker. In the first few days, it shows. All right. Yeah. On a side note, he's wearing shorts, which is fine, plenty of hikers hike in shorts, but personally, all I can think of is poison ivy. I can't wear shorts in the summer at all because the next day I'll have blisters all over my ankles. I like shorts, they're comfy and easy to wear, but on a big hike like this, I wouldn't be caught dead in them. Despite the setbacks and the constant rain, Robert is optimistic. Most people would have turned back after the first few days, but this trip is more than just butterflies for him. It's personal. He's grieving the loss of his wife, and he hopes that nature will heal him. But first, it's gonna need to break him down. And we see that when he tries to catch his first butterfly. Excited by the hunt, he's chasing after it and doesn't see the cliff he's about to run over. He trips, but manages to hang on, only losing his butterfly net, which had some sentimental value because his wife gave it to him, but I guess hanging on for dear life is more important. He manages to get up safely and sees the butterfly he was trying to get, and it turns out it's a pretty common one, not even worth keeping. Apelio Indira. Well, you're really quite common. Did you know that? Flashback to Bob filling his wife's pills. We see that he's all business, worried about getting prescriptions filled and getting his wife to appointments. But Thea is the opposite, making light of the situation by telling a very bad knock-knock joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Dad. That's not funny. 
But she also adds she has something else planned for him. A little surprise for after she dies. It was a little funny. Sometime after the funeral, Bob gets a letter in the mail. It's a Guggenheim, which are grants awarded to creative people so that they can further their art. For Robert, that means butterfly research. That was the surprise his wife planned for him. The money is great, but the trip is something that he hadn't planned on. A month out in the woods with very little resources? Well, as we've already seen, he isn't ready for this. But his wife knew that he could do it. Wait, what? Robert has very little food and planned on living off the land. So, part of that means eating berries. And sometimes, berries don't agree with you. He runs to take a dump and hears something big out in the woods. Our first hint at Bigfoot. Scared, he runs away, slipping in some nasty berry poop. He gets to a water source and is able to clean up. And here is where we get to the main theme of this movie. It's not about butterflies, Bigfoot, or even cancer. It's about seeing David Cross naked. Seriously, you see him like this just about every scene. Even in the end credits, they have a special thank you to Fruit of the Loom. I wouldn't be surprised if they produced this whole film. Either way, I didn't sign up for this. While trying to catch more butterflies, Bob hears a whooping sound in the distance. Then, it's all around him. He tries to find where it's coming from. And right in the middle of the trail, a big footprint. Despite not being prepared and maybe not being in the best physical shape of his life, we see that Robert is learning. He comes to a fork in the road where he can take an easy trail or an experienced trail, and he goes for the harder path. We also see that he's ricked up a new butterfly net out of his old shirt, so he's getting it. A little bit down the trail, Robert literally stumbles upon some people picking berries, and they shoot at him, thinking he is Bigfoot. She thought you were a Bigfoot. That's a far stretch. Do I look like a goddamn Bigfoot to you? As an apology, they make him some popcorn around the fire and get to you talking. Like David Koechner makes a cameo and yes, plays not, what he plays best, a drunk. What do you think? The what? family are impressed that Bob's made it this far, and we learn a little bit you, about the area. The Native Americans used to trade down by the lake, but so, kept getting chased away by Bigfoot and that the beasts live in the lava tunnels. Robert is also told about how Bigfoot will interfere with the white man when they become too selfish and take away from nature. All foreshadowing, as we'll soon see. The next morning, we wake up to chainsaws and Bob almost gets hit by a tree. I kind of feel like that's on him. He should have known that they were right there cutting it down. Anyway, there's a bunch of overturned vehicles. Obviously, we know it was Bigfoot that did it, but the loggers think it was Bob. How? I don't know, maybe he's Superman. They rough him up a bit, but the boss stops it, and they get back to work. Let that poor guy go before he pisses himself. Here's a little part that sticks out to me. Bob tries to be aggressive and demands the names of the workers who just beat him up, but the boss won't tell him. Instead, offers him coffee. And Robert is just like, okay, fine. Even when he's mad, he's polite. They get to talking about the deforestation, and the boss is upset that they have to work around the endangered spotted owl. Bob, on the other hand, finds this outrageous. This is a species on the brink of extinction but humans want to destroy its home just for resources? However, they bring up how if we don't remove the lumber, then it falls down and builds up kindling over the years, and eventually, lightning strikes it and the whole forest will burn down. 
I like how they give you both sides of the coin here. It's easy to go in and say, oh no, deforestation is bad, think of the owls, and we should, but at the same time, it might be necessary. As confident and as sure of himself as he is, Bob still gets lost. He climbs up to higher ground, and we get the only glimpse of Bigfoot in the whole movie, which is a bummer. But we'll get to that. With no help there and still being lost, he settles in for the night, but wakes up to a rainstorm and has to retreat to a cave. He's letting his clothes dry, so of course he's in his underwear the whole time and goes deeper into the cave. Inside, the place is huge, and there are even cave paintings on the wall. It would be a great place to explore. You know, if you had clothes on. He trips and falls, getting pretty banged up. When he comes to, he hears what sounds like a growl that I'm just gonna say is Bigfoot. That's all the encouragement he needs to quickly climb up and out of the cave. Back on the trail, he sees the spotted owl that everyone is talking about. He takes this as a sign from his wife, and once it lands on his head, it all but confirms it for him. We can see on a signpost that he's getting closer and closer to his final destination, until he sees it, Columbia Gorge. He gets a moment to take it all in and thanks his wife for planning this awesome adventure for him. Some guys are on the trail and after learning how far he's walked, they say he's earned a beer. And yeah, for sure. They inform him that it's 4th of July weekend and there won't be any buses to take him back. So they give him a ride to his car. But he's amazed that it's the 4th of July. He was only supposed to be out there until June 22nd. I guess time flies when you're walking around half naked in a cave searching for Bigfoot. He makes it back to the start of his journey and gets ready to head home. But just one more whistle into the woods to see if anything is out there. And, well, there is. And that was the Dark Divide. Calling it a Bigfoot drama might be a bit of a stretch. He's not really in it, aside from a few references. If you cut them out of the film, it wouldn't have been any different. I wish they would have maybe shown more than just a fleeting glimpse of Bigfoot. Maybe we could see him in the cave, or better yet, have him carry Bob out after he fell. But the film is pretty grounded, and I don't think they wanted to make it that unbelievable. But the real life story the movie's based on might have had more to do with the big guy. The book Robert Pyle wrote was called Where Bigfoot Walks, and the Guggenheim that he was actually awarded wasn't to study butterflies, it was to study Bigfoot. Robert Pyle is still alive today, and it makes me wonder what it must be like to see the biggest journey of your entire life played out on film by a known actor. David Cross does a fantastic job. He's a funny guy when it's called for, but he can play it pretty serious when he needs to. But Deborah Messing really needs a shout out as well. She's fantastic as Thea. In the short flashbacks, we see all the signs of grief that she's going through. Watch The Dark Divide when you want a more serious drama. Just don't expect Bigfoot to be in it. I give it three Fruit of the Looms out of four. You think I crapped my pants, don't you? You think I crapped my own pants? Why would I do that? Why would I? Oh yeah, run away! Run away from the pants-crapping monster! Yes! God. 
guess it does look like I crap my pants. No, it doesn't, because it's on the outside. If I did that, it would have had to go all the way through. I take it back. 